desert landscape, the amount of wildlife that you see, the amazing sunsets, um, the, the variation in the terrain. This park goes from a Sonoran Desert ecosystem all the way up to a mixed conifer ecosystem on the top of the Rincon Mountains, which get close to 9,000 feet. So the, the diversity is amazing. And I, I think that's probably one thing that makes this park pretty special is the, the diversity of the vegetation, the wildlife, um, and, and the landscape that, you're, that greets you everywhere. Suwara National Monument was established in 1933, and one of the primary reasons for that was for the protection of this uh, cactus uh, forest that you, is surrounding us here. Uh, and in the 1930s, uh, it, was, it was a vast and very dense stand of, of large and small saguaros um, that, that covered the whole valley behind me. And, uh, Throughout the, with repeat photography of this site, it was shown that um, the saguaro cactus forest appeared to be disappearing. Uh, many of the mature saguaros were dying um, and, and, and leaving the population, and not very many new saguaros were being recruited. We've since learned that impacts from grazing and also from um, a widespread harvest of mesquite trees and other trees, Palo Verde, uh, impacted this cactus forest. Um, saguaros depend on uh, a nurse tree early in their, in, in their growth, first for getting established, for being protected from the extreme heat and sun, and then also from the cold temperatures during the winter. So if uh, a seed falls and a, a, a young saguaro is able to get established, under that nurse tree, it helps to ensure that it's going to grow. They're very slow growing. Um, many of these cactus in, in here are approaching 200 years or even potentially older. Um, the really large ones with all those arms um, can be a couple centuries old. Usually they're, by the time they're about 50 years old, maybe 15 feet tall, they're starting to grow their first arms. So um, the, even a saguaro that's only a couple feet on the ground has been there for decades. Um, so as time has progressed, you can see now that mesquite, there's a you know, healthy forest of mesquite in here in Palo Verdes. They are now acting as nurse trees again. Um, one thing that you don't really see behind me because of all those trees is the fact that there is a lot of young saguaros. Um, we have done extensive surveys in this area and actually using a lot of volunteers and uh, citizen scientists who have come out here and helped us um, walk across the landscape in a grid fashion to document all of the saguaros um, in a mile square area here. And what we see is that even though you can't see it looking out across this valley, um, there are many, many, many more saguaros that are going to be coming up and turning into those grand majestic saguaros in the decades to come because they are now thriving. So we're monitoring. We continue to do a saguaro census, so every 10 years, coinciding with the U.S. Census, um, we have these established plots where we go out and we count every saguaro. We measure its height. We count how many um, nest holes, nest cavities are in the saguaros, um, how many arms are on them, and um, monitor that po the, the population of, the, of our saguaros through time. Um, that will help inform us as to what's happening in the population. We are on the historic cactus forest loop of our east district of the park. Um, we refer to this as the Rincon Mountain District. This, uh, this roadway was constructed by the CCC um, and has served as a primary you know, tourist loop, um, a way to get out into the park, see, see the saguaro cactus, the other vegetation that's here. You have an opportunity to see most of what's in this park. Uh, Gila monsters, jackrabbits, roadrunners, uh, uh, probably up, you know, over a hundred bird species potentially. And then obviously all of this uh, unique Sonoran desert vegetation. Um, many species of Choya cactus, prickly pear cactus, obviously our, our namesake saguaro cactus. Um, and many other species, small, ones that you have to look pretty close to find, and then other, others that are large and um, prominent on the landscape. And then it's just, you know, people refer to the desert, they think of um, 
sparse landscape uh, that's hot and there's nothing there. But actually, as you can see out the window here, um, this, this place is thick with vegetation. Um, we're still really green right now because of the monsoon rains and um, the Yocatillo are still leafed out and it's, it's, it's a sea of uh, plants and wildlife out here. 2015 was our um, highest visitation on record and um, we continue to see those numbers increase on a month to month basis this year. So, you know, people are finding their park here at Saguaro National Park. Um, and I think across the country, visitation has been increasing and certainly the centennial, the, the advertising campaign, all of the different initiatives to get people engaged with their parks, you know, in their community and across the country has, I think, is, 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 has been extremely successful. Um, you know, we want to be reaching out to our, the diversity of our communities, improving our visitation, not just in numbers, but in the richness of, of the visitors that we have at our parks. Um, you know, representing what America is today. I grew up just south of here as a, as a, as a kid, uh, but then I came up here to the University of Arizona uh, to go to school. I uh, got my undergrad and my graduate degree here, um, and I've been in Tucson for about 26 years. You know, we've got an, a, an exploding population here in Tucson. Uh, we're about 44% Latino, and um, I, like I said before, I came to college, I've lived here for 26 years, and I'd never been to the national park here in Tucson. Uh, I got recruited uh, out of the local county government here as the community engagement coordinator uh, because I was, as they said, the target audience of the next hundred years. So um, it was almost an experiment to see uh, what it would take to engage uh, folks of my demographic um, to, to uh, attend the parks. And, and some folks argue that historically the Park Service has not been very inviting, uh, but I would say over the last five years there's been a concerted effort to try to engage not just folks uh, of color, but folks of different abilities. Uh, a lot of our facilities have been made uh, uh, accessible to folks with disabilities. Uh, so that, that, that's part and parcel what, what, what I think is keeping some folks away is that they still think it's the old National Park Service that is very limited uh, to vehicles, very limited to, I mean it's, it's almost like some folks think uh, we're, we're set up for, for professional hikers and, uh, and we're not. It, it, it really is uh, designed uh, to, to be accessible to, to all. Um, here in Tucson Recently, we, uh, we, we had funding to establish an all uh, ADA accessible uh, walkway. Well, the walkway, unfortunately, uh, was part of uh, the old horseman's trails, and uh, we had uh, a horse vandalize, whether purposely or, or involuntarily, uh, they damaged uh, one of the trails. And the community came out, including the Horseman's Association, and they said, hey, we're sorry about that, you know, we, we, we want to help out. Here's a small contribution to help uh, repair the, the trail. And so folks take care of each other here in Tucson, um, and they really care about making sure the parks are accessible to, to different folks. Having national parks, you know, it's one of those true American ideas that originated in the United States. The people of this country, we know that they value the national park system and all of these wonderful places and, and, and different resources that, that we have, natural and cultural resources. Um, you know, advocacy is something that's really important and being relevant to our current park visitors is extremely important. We want to, to provide an opportunity for them to get outside, to learn about the outdoors, the, the, these, these resources that the wildlife is dependent upon, but that we are also dependent upon. You know, clean water, clean air, these things originate in national parks. Um, the more people that can visit and understand that, the more likely we are to have a new generation that embraces the importance of that and wants to protect it into the future.